Hey, what's going on, everybody? Are you confused about what's happening in today's society with all this AI talk and trying to figure out if it's taking over the world? Are we going to have a new Skynet taking over and making sure that robots are constantly watching over us, protecting our streets, or potentially taking over the world? Well, in today's conversation, I'm going to be talking with Christian Hammer. Christian actually had me on his podcast a couple weeks ago, so I'm super excited to have him over here on my show. Christian hosts the Techtastic podcast where he talks all things tech. And so he is an expert to be discussing AI with us today. And I was super excited myself to have him on the show because I am working on an AI receptionist. And so talking these things with Christian has been quite a blast. But before we jump into Christian's story a little bit longer and we can talk about Vala, his company he's working on right now, I want to read the quote of the day. This one's from Teddy Roosevelt here. It says, believe you can, and you're already halfway there. So I felt like this quote today was applicable to people like Christian, myself, and a lot of the listeners, because most of the time we're trying to figure out what the heck is even going on. And in today's generation of AI and trying to figure out where we're headed, this is the perfect message. If you believe it, you're already halfway there and you're going to continue on a successful journey. So Christian, thanks for joining us on today's episode of Get Over Yourself podcast. Brandon, thanks for having me on here, man. I have to say one thing. Uh, if you can't beat them, join them. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the AI apocalypse. Hey, you never know. In Terminator, uh, what's his name? Uh, Connor? Price Connor? Yeah. I'm blanking right now. Yeah. His name was yeah, Connor. He, something. Uh, yeah. Something. Connor Price, something like that. Anyways, he ends up saving the day. Eventually, Arnold Schwarzenegger gets taken down. So I think it's going to work out just fine either way. Yeah, but, yeah we just got to find our, our Connor. Yeah, we got to find it. We got to find it exactly. So guys, this is going to be a fun conversation. If you're interested in learning more about AI, if you have no idea what's going on in today's world with AI and you feel like you don't even understand it or use ChatGPT or something similar, today is the conversation for you. So with that being said, let's jump into today's episode. So Christian, thanks once again for hopping on. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you come from, and why we should all fear AI to the doom. <laughs> well, we should definitely fear it. Uh, my background goes back quite a ways. I did my first company when I was in diapers is the best way to describe it. I was very young in a daycare center. I don't know if I was actually in diapers, but I got into technology at a very, very young age and have stuck with it since. Uh, early dot com, you know, the same thing that a lot of people that are at the same stage in life as I am, they'll say, I did a dot-com version one studio. I was building websites for people when they said, what, what's the web, what's this interwebs thing? You know, uh, going all the way back to that. Lots of startups by 2001, no, that was before that was 1999, we did an incubator uh, and then the dot-com boom bust cycle kind of happened. Since then have led uh, large technology organizations for companies like Nike and Maersk and others. Uh, brought in as like an entrepreneur trying to give them a digital DNA. But at the center of all of this has been how can we best leverage the technology to empower humans to do more and to make our lives better, not worse. And so as we talk about AI, for me, it's one of those utopian things that we've always dreamed of going all the way back to like the first time I remember referencing something that looks like our modern chat GPT world is when Steve Jobs was releasing uh, Visual, not Visual Studio, sorry. It was called Visual Basic, the, the programming language, on the PC, weirdly. And he was talking about it being the first time that the computer talks to you rather than you having to write code to talk to it. The computer speaks the language you understand. And that's the promise of what AI is for me. It's, it's been that from the first time that I, I was a kid writing code. I was like, I understand the arcane way of talking to this stupid machine so that it'll do what I want. Uh, and now anybody has that power. You can talk to the machine the way that you talk. You can speak to it directly. You can chat, you know, sit down and type it in. It understands you. And that's a pretty beautiful thing. And it's insane to think. Obviously, this has been in the works, especially when you think of companies like OpenAI. This has been in the works for years now. But it's only really come to market in the past year and a half, give or take. <laughs> where people could actually start using it and understanding it. Yeah. And I, I'm talking pure terms of like chat GBT. And then obviously every single other one, like Claude and all these others are popping up on the market. But I remember one of my roommates at the time um, when I was, when I was still in college and doing everything with him, 
he opens up chat GBT and this is like the first any of us have seen it. It's brand spanking new to the public who can actually access it. And he goes, yo, Brandon, come check this out. I gave this thing a set of parameters on writing me a love poem to a girl I like. And I told it to give me it in haiku form and it did it perfectly. And that was like my first introduction into specifically chat GBT. And I was like, holy crap, this thing is amazing. And terrifying. It, it was not right? Right. You're looking at oh, it and going very terrifying. Yeah. Those of us that have been in, like I've been in some form of ML data science um, systems for a long time. We, we, when we were doing predictive systems for advertising and choosing which audience to go after targeting and all that kind of stuff, we were doing some form of it and going even before that we were doing some form of uh, machine learning. So I felt like I was at the core of what was going on and we were looking at the things that open AI and others were doing and saying, ah, oh, it's a decade away before it'll have any meaningful impact. And then all of a sudden, boom, this 3.0 comes out and it was a fundamental shift in the power and the capabilities of that thing. And for me, it knocked me back a big, like I, I looked at everything I'd spent the last long time doing, I'm not gonna say how long, um, my career to this point and said, oh no, everything that we've built, everything I've ever done is meaningless. Nobody needs guys to write software anymore and they sure as heck don't need the leadership team that sits around and tells people what to write. Like that career's over. That's what I thought. It's not. In fact, we have greater need now than we did, you know, a year and a half ago when it came out. And partially that's because these are imprecise things. It's still not a human. It still doesn't really understand us. It doesn't have the needs, wants, and desires. You need somebody to tell it that. That's why there's a, you know, the chat prompt or something to talk to it. But when it gets into the complex nature of a, the real world, when you interact with a bunch of other systems, like in an enterprise, a large company, it doesn't have the capability of understanding that yet. There's that need today. And every person who doesn't know what they're doing and sits down and says, make me a website or make me an app that does X, Y, or Z, all they're doing is creating tech debt. They're just creating a big pile of stuff somebody's going to have to clean up someday. Well, there's an opportunity. Yeah, there's a business opportunity for everyone listening out there. Figure out how to clean up all the crap that's getting put into these prompts right now. <laughs> yeah. Let's mention Vala AI, shall we? <laughs> yeah, shall we? <laughs> no, before we jump full force into that as well, though, yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about some of the opportunities that come with AI through the sure. business sector, through personal lives, through hospitality, through caretaking, through every, every kind of industry there possibly is. And then also some of kind of the setbacks to begin though. People always ask me when I'm building out, um, interval here, okay, you're creating an AI receptionist for automotive businesses. Yep. Then that's exactly what we're doing. So one of the big takes backs that people have for us is, okay, won't you be destroying jobs? And this is kind yeah. of one of the, every generation, every new technological wave, somebody is worried about jobs completely going away. And this one's a little bit different because the overall goal with AI is to automate things and to make it more seamless for the users and to overall create an easier lifestyle. So one answer I always give to these people who are worried about that is I believe AI, this is a personal belief. I want to hear your take on it, Christian. I believe AI will get rid of a lot of the mundane jobs that do the back to back to back, same old task every single time. And honestly, it wastes human development. It wastes the human potential we have inside of ourselves. What do you think? I, I, that's almost word for word for something I would say, frankly. Like if you look at what we're trying to, on, all software is, is the automation of things people didn't, you, they used to do, but they don't want to do anymore. Word processor replaced a lot of jobs. Photoshop replaced a lot of jobs. A lot of these tools that we interact with regularly, they replace other jobs. AI is no different. It will replace jobs. There's no question about that. But it's replacing, it's replacing, it's so hard to say these words without feeling like a jerk saying because it comes from an ivory tower like you to some degree, right? It's replacing the jobs that people would prefer they didn't do. Like you don't want to spend your time going through and spell checking a document. Let's, let's pick on something that exists, right? Spell check's a wonderful tool. There used to be a role for that. There was a person that would go through and go through all the copy of everything written and they would highlight it and say, misspelling, et cetera. Right. We elevated that to a more important role now. It didn't, an editor didn't used to be so important from a, 
you know, what is the thought you're putting out there? What's the message you're putting out there? That's a much more elevated role than it used to be. It used to be a lot more like a copyright checking things and making sure you spelled correctly and that you use the right punctuation. That's going to happen here too. And I think that when, when I, I'm very focused on the tech debt software development part of the world, because there's a mountain of it. And when I look at the things I hate doing in that space, those are the things we should automate the janitorial jobs of software development. Let's elevate the responsibility of the human to creating something of value, maybe something beautiful, but definitely something of value. And that's where we should be. We're great. Humans are great at grasping disparate things and pulling them together in a new and interesting way and creating value in that. What we're not great at is mundane, trivial tasks that are repetitive. Now, the weird thing, this is the thing that took me, knocked me back a bit with ChatGPT when it came out, is it looks like it's doing some of the stuff we wanted to be just us. Your friend wrote a haiku right? Like it, a love letter haiku, that's something he couldn't do probably. Like maybe he wasn't a very good writer and he didn't know how to start it even. Great. But what did it do? It, yes, it's, it maybe took, I mean, was he going to go pay a poet to write that for him? Probably not, right? He had a picture in his head. He had some thoughts in his mind that he wanted to get into the world and he didn't know how to do it. And this tool gave him that. And I think the same thing is true of like the generative like the ones that are creating pictures and stuff like that. There are a lot of people that have something they want to say to the world in the form of an image, but they, they're not a paint. I can paint, right? You, know, I, you can see my studio, go to c-hammer.com if you want to see my paintings, if you have any questions about that. But most people can't. And is it, does that devalue what they're trying to share with the world? I don't think so. I, I just think that I learned some techniques and I learned some tools that they don't have. And they could learn it and put the time into it to do that. And maybe that means the value of what I create is more, but I don't know why it would. The message is the important part. Uh, so yeah. that's how I- I, I got to jump in there for yeah. a second. Yeah. So art is a very interesting case to bring up when we're talking AI, because I feel like that's one of those jobs that can never fully be taken away. For Correct. a crappy artist, somebody who can't even draw a stick figure right like me, that is the perfect example. When I hop on Dolly, of course, it makes some funky images and I have to rewrite the prompt a couple times and say, I like this, take this out, change the colors here. And it takes some tweaking. But that's still a million times faster than an artist like you or anyone else out there who sits down, actually takes the time to digitally create art or on a piece of pen and paper or on canvas, you know. And so looking at that specific industry, though, it interests me because I feel like the more and more we turn to AI and to automation and to releasing some of the human element outside of it, those, those jobs, those industries that really have that emotion and that feeling and that human touch that AI simply cannot replicate, at least for the time being, it is not even close to replicating how a human feels or understands. Those kind of artists are always going to have an advantage because they're going to have that human element. Yeah, but I on the flip side, as we are already talking about, there are these industries and like Christian said, I hope this doesn't offend anyone out there, but there are industries where, frankly, the human potential is being wasted. When you Absolutely. sit down and you – call centers. This is the perfect example. I'm, I'm in the AI receptionist <laughs> space, but call centers. You don't need somebody for the most part. In a few more years as it gets better and better, you will not need a call center running anymore. Having hundreds of human bodies located in some country making horrible wages just from Reading sitting there script. answering a phone that you could hardly understand. Yeah. Their potential is so much more than that. And that's the beauty of where we can automate that with AI. Absolutely. And the, the, the hard part here is that whenever you have a major disruption to an entire, it's not one industry, it's all industries are impacted by this. The web yep. did a similar thing. I don't think it did it to this degree, but it had a very similar impact. The computer being introduced to the office had a massive impact, right? Every time people panic, they're like, oh, what am I going to do now? What's my job? That's a good question. What's your job today? Are you creating value in some form? How does that change because of this new technology? Do I have to learn new skills? Like we all, I, I would say my job has been to be constantly learning. There's never been a chance where I can just be like, okay, I know it all now. I, I, I got it. I can just continue doing this thing. That's never occurred every day. Wow, look at that. We have to, re oh, wow, new pattern, new technologies, new ideas. And I think that in a lot of places, people are in roles where they were comfortable doing things with 
a set of tools. And if you look at like the going back to the art thing, let's talk about advertising, a place that is fundamentally getting altered on every front right now. Copywriting, I'm using AI to do it. The images that I'm using, I'm using AI to do it, right? I'm, but I'm not going to generate a campaign that way. I'm not going to go to chat GPT and say, I need to create an advertising came from my Vala AI, you know, startup company that targets this type of user and this type of user. And it's going to spit out anything actually meaningful, impactful. It'll spit out something that I could have gone to Fiverr or something else and have done. Cool. But if I really want to have impact, I'm going to go find a human being that can emotionally connect it to the audience. And that's what they're going to do. And it gives them a chance to experiment fast. Like, oh, let, what about, let, let's try this type of tagline. Let's try this type of image. Let's try, like, let's see what works until we find that thing that is, that's the emotional connection. That's the part we need. I think that we're always going to need that. I, I very much doubt that, a, you know, a series of connected computers, no matter how clever, are ever going to feel emotion really because they don't have the chemical, biological response to things that we have. And it's that human connection and that human emotional response that we're going to go into. What does that mean for jobs, though? Because if all the mundane tasks are done, and that's what most jobs are, and that's how we make a living, and by that I mean literally I can't eat if I don't have a job and I can't get food, right? How do we change that, too? Because that's got to come along with it. You can't mm -hmm. automate all the jobs away and then expect people to not starve. So we, we're at a moment and a very important inflection point where our technology is starting to really knock on the door of the way that our society is structured and how we interrelate with each other. And we have to be able to address it. And we haven't really started talking about it yet. Yeah. Going back to your example of kind of when the internet really started to boom and how many companies were successful because of it, but there's also tons of companies that didn't succeed because of it. Yeah. And I, I saw this statistic. I was at an AI lecture where they were talking a lot of the same concepts we're talking today. And there was a statistic where they brought up kind of different innovations that have happened over the course of the past couple centuries. And so they bring up, say, for instance, uh, the personal computer, the ones that you could start using at your, your company. And when they started becoming more useful, it took it six, seven, eight years for people to start adopting computers and helping them recognize like, oh, wow, this can actually help me in my business. Yeah, I've And then obviously as... Oh, yeah. It, yeah, it took a long time. And so yeah. as it starts growing, people aren't using it, aren't using it. They're f kind of hearing about it, buzzwords, whatever. But then as people start realizing the capabilities it has, boom, you just see this, the number skyrocket on this chart this guy's showing. And then the same thing goes for the internet. It takes a couple of years for people to adopt, a couple of years, and then it skyrockets. But what was interesting is it took less time than the computer. And then he jumped over and he was trying to explain it for AI. And he goes, look, these are the gaps that the computer um the internet had but this is ai's guys let's be honest a monkey could figure out how to use chat gpt right now it is not that hard and so his his whole point was this learning curve that it took for these other kind of innovations these things every single one of us uses every day ai is going to be a little bit different because the the gap for people to start using it it's happening now the gap is non-existent the gap is now uh, it and it's having i mean anybody who I said this to somebody earlier and I liked the way that it came out and I'm trying to remember exactly how I said it, but it was effectively, if you start right now, you are infinitely ahead of the person that starts tomorrow. If you're looking for a, like, what comes next? What do I do next? If I'm trying to find a way that I create value in the world, the best thing you could do is start now. Actually, the best thing that you could have done is start three years ago, but you can't do that. So start now because it gives you Every, these tools are so easy to use and they're so good at automating things that you can start automating your own life. You can get rid of the, like, I don't like the, for, for example, when I get up in the morning, I used to have an admin that would sit down and she would put my day to together. This was a long time ago, by the way. And a piece of paper would sit on my desk. First thing in the morning, I get that piece of paper and I'd look at it and go, okay, I've got a call with David. I'm going to be on Brandon's show at this time. And I'd kind of like put some notes on it and I'd have my day figured out, right? Every one of those things, setting the calendar, putting together my notes for the show, considering what I was going to talk to Brandon about, like all of those things, as well as the document that you spit out, I can have an AI tool do for me now. I could sit down and say like, okay, I don't, I don't need a person to do that. And I sure as heck don't need to be doing the work myself on that stuff. 
right? You, I do a podcast. I don't sit down with my guest and then pull up their profile. Actually, I do. I think we all do. But I could have it like as the show comes up, have a little AI tool that said, okay, Brendan did this. He did this. This is his show. This is what it's about. Hey, he's got more viewers than you. Maybe you should make fun of him about that. Like you could, you could put together a thing like that that automated a big chunk of preparing for a show. And that's a trivial thing. What part of your day-to-day stuff that you deal with that sucks? Like another one's email. My God, between email and Slack and Discord and all the various Reddit and all the places I have to be because we're talking to so many different people about different things. There's so much noise coming in. I just want to find the important messages. I could automate that. Heck, I could automate the response. I could probably, and I actually, I know this to be true. I could actually automate this interaction right now. I could put a video avatar of myself with my voice on this show if I wanted to. That would be silly. I wouldn't do that. But there, there are so many things that you do to, in your day-to-day that you could start to automate. And everything that you do, everything that you eliminate for your, from the need for you to do tomorrow means you could do something more important tomorrow. And maybe that more important is automating the next thing and eliminating it. And el- until you get to the point, and this is something my wife has done incredibly well, her job doesn't take her 40 hours a week. It's probably an 80-hour a week job, but it takes her like eight hours a week. Because she's, fi- because she's got me. She's figured out how to automate a lot of those things away. She doesn't have to do them anymore. They were meaningless. The value was in her knowledge and experience. It wasn't in doing the tasks. So, so she Christian, away. Yeah. I'm going to need you real quick to snap your fingers. I got to make sure you're not an avatar pre-recorded here. All right. There we go, guys. There we go. <laughs> it's, it's for sure now. Um, you bring up an interesting point where it's pure automation. These days, if you have the right mind to it or you can hire the right person for it, you can figure out a way to automate everything. I, heck, I just signed up. One of my biggest tasks right now is sending out a million cold emails every single day to companies Ugh. we're trying to get, get to use our software. Yeah. The most draining thing. And so I signed up for a platform that basically does it. I, I barely touch anything and they do most of the work for me. And now it's freed me up. I just started using this a couple of days ago. So more knowledge will come in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully it works good enough to keep using. But so far on my day to day, Today, specifically, when I would have sent, spent three hours trying to send cold emails, collect emails and whatnot, that completely got automated. I didn't have to touch it once today. And that's, that's a great use case. But on the flip side, one of the greatest arguments against AI is humans are going to lose creativity. Humans are going to lose that sense of compassion, that, that inner desire to get things done. And this is a conversation I had with my co-founder as we're working on an AI startup. This is a conversation we had yesterday where we said, what is the genera- the next generation going to look like? The guys and girls who were two, three years old, unborn right now, that are just going to be entering into school, is it really starts taking off. What is it going to look like for them? And we, we joked around with each other. I said, "If dude, if ChatGBT was, was out when I was in high school, I would have never once written in paper. And that's the brutal, honest truth. So, so what's your take on that? I don't think it would. So the, the, the statement that it takes away creativity or it eliminates the creativity, I think that there are things that we misdiagnose as creativity, like the writing itself is not the creative action. The, the creative action is forming new insights from what you read that you then put into the paper. That's the creativity of it. Now, you're going to have to at least give those insights back to the chat GPT thing to write the paper. Like, because if you just, had it spit out a generic paper, you're going to get a C like everybody else. If you want the A, what was your what was your insight? This is the same thing that's true if you're raising money for a company and you walk in and say, this is what we're doing, nobody cares. If you say, this is what we're in doing because of this really important insight that nobody else has, everybody cares. That's what we're freed up from. You have so much access to information and the ability to check it really quickly. And I don't mean do all the research quickly. I mean, put it out in the wild and see what happens quickly. If I wrote a paper just two years ago, if I was going to write a white paper on a subject, it would take me three months to get do all the research, put it together, edit it, review it. And that, that was even with a high degree of automation. Now I can do it in a day, an hour, 20 minutes. I'm going to pull together the things that I think are important. Like, okay, we need to talk about this aspect of that because this is the important part that the AI doesn't know that. It will after I tell it, and now it'll put it in everybody else's paper, right? But uh, the accumulation of knowledge that's represented in our ability to push that forward, I think, accelerates our ability to learn. Because if you think about it this way, 
if I, who's the best teacher for you? I would, I would argue it's a combination of two things. Somebody that has profound ability to make insights and make those available to you. Like if I wanted to teach somebody about physics, I would say, I want Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr's. I want those two people to teach you physics because they had, one had an incredible way of thinking about the problem, his, his dreams and his daydreams and, and the way that he think about it and how he came up with insights. And the other was just really good at sharing those insights in a way that was like profound and impactful. Those would be great teachers. How, who has access to those as teachers? Nobody, right? One's dead. And the, well, I think the other backs are both dead. I actually, if, Niels, if you're still alive, I'm sorry. but. Uh, you don't have access to them even if they were even if they were here amongst us, right? So we have that ability too, and I think what it does, your point about like the we'll call it the laziness factor. Are people just going to become lazier? I think most people already are. I think that like people do tend towards the minimum, and those people are going to be able to do more because the automation is going to go further, but then there are other people that just can't stomach to not do, to not create. Like I don't start businesses and create artwork because I have some, like, I don't know. I have somebody pushing me to do it. That's me. I'm pushing me to do it. I, I have it. I'm almost incapable of not doing something for not creating. And I think there is enough of us so that that'll continue on and we'll be the ones that change the world. That's always been true. Right. When fire was first discovered, somebody looked at it and said, wow, I can cook with that. You know, lightning struck the ground, the stick caught on fire and they realized that it made the food taste better or it made it gave them more calories, whatever. They figured out some wonderful thing about it. Another person grabbed that fire and said, I can heat my home with this. I can take it into my cave or my tent or whatever. And I can heat with it. And another one said, I can burn your village down with it. More was created from it. Right. We all have the ability for both create creation and destruction. And there are those of us who will always be driven to do something that doesn't change. Technology is never going to break that. I do worry about the next generation and what their jobs will look like and how they're going to interface with society because that's an unknown that we are fundamentally altering when we talk about these technologies. But we're also, we're only talking about AI at the moment. There's 10 other technologies that are going to impact a lot more of the jobs, right? Autonomous vehicles. How many jobs in the United States alone are just being replaced by that? Every truck driver, every bus driver, every taxi driver, every forklift operator, every operator of heavy machinery around a construction site, all of those are automatable with that type of technology. What about robotics? Now you're talking about nursing, restaurant work, like all the manual labor work that goes into a warehouse, et cetera. What about, like, as you go through a lot of these, what you realize pretty fast is that's a lot of jobs, right? That's a lot of things being disrupted all at the same time, and that will have a societal impact. And we do have to consider what we're doing there. It doesn't mean stop. It doesn't mean don't do the AI or don't do the robotics, because we also have another problem. And that is, we have, like, my parents' generation is now getting to the point where They've been out of the workforce. Now they're moving into nursing homes and such. Who's going to take care of them? Because there's way more of them than there is my generation. <laughs> the boomers are a huge generation, right? We're having a problem as, the, the, as we become a wealthier and more sophisticated society, we're older too. And that older means that we don't have new workers coming in at the same rate that we have older workers leaving. And that creates a gap. Well, this is a partial way to fill that, or maybe it overfills it, but it is a societal impact. It's a global one, and we do have to think about it. I don't know what the next, next, next generation's kids do, but I do believe that that's a question more of like the Star Trek universe, where it's one of, if you took away the need to have a job to eat and to have a shelter over your, house, over your head, if you took away all the, the fundamental basics of just living. Those are covered. What would you do with your life? What would you go explore the universe? Would you create something new? Would you cure a disease? Would you create art? What would you do? I think that that's the problem that most people have never answered for themselves. They, everybody takes the path that is easiest for them because life's hard enough, right? 
I go into a career path because it was open to me. I, you know, my dad did or whatever. It was easy for me to get into school to do that. I was naturally good at it, whatever. I went that path. I never really questioned what I would do otherwise. Now we have to ask that question. And that's the most human thing that we all have to face that most people have never had to deal with. The last time we had to deal with it was when agriculture was invented. And we were like, am I going to go work in the field or am I going to continue hunting the woolly mammoth over on the step there? I've got to make a fundamental change in the way I live my life. And since then, we've all been on, co on like autopilot, <laughs> taking the path that's right in front of us. Yeah. And Christian, I think I don't want this to go unnoticed. I think the best thing you said in that entire spiel there was that at the end of the day, those who are willing to still work, be creative, create new innovations, have drive in their life. Those Everyone who listens to this pod, podcast, basically, everyone who's trying to chase something inside of their life and who's trying to make a name for themselves, those are the ones who will use it to their benefit to help them do the kind of seamless tasks that will occupy their time to be a better creative. And that's what it's going to help with at the end of the day. But as the caveat, as the little asterisk at the end of the sentence, we have to be aware of, and maybe this is just the way humans are evolving. Humans are made to learn and evolve and grow. And maybe this is where it's taking us. But for everyone who uses these, these automation tools, and <laughs> we only are just getting the tip of the iceberg right now for everything that is going to happen here in the near future. But anyone who uses that just to simply put their life on autopilot, sit down on a, on a couch, watch some TV and do nothing with their life those are going to be the ones who are in trouble because at the end of the day, the people sure AI might take some jobs, but it will create thousands of others purely because humans always want to innovate and want to become better. And that's our yeah. driving factor. So if you aren't one of those humans, if you're lazy, if you're boring, if you, if you have zero drive whatsoever inside of your life, yes, you should be worried. And that's coming from the deepest part of my heart. And that's, that's as simple as we could put it. But Christian, as we're kind of closing out on today's episode of the Get Over Yourself podcast, uh, any last insights you want to share? Anything else on how people could reach out to you? Now, the, the first thing I would say is uh, you should check out volaai.com uh, if you're in technology. We are trying to solve this the, the problem of technical debt. And I would say that we are, aut honestly, we're automating all the janitorial services of software development. There's a lot of stuff you don't want to do. We will happily do it for you. That's first. The second is check out It's Tectastic. We talk about subjects like this all the time. Brandon was a fantastic guest on the show uh, and uh, love to have you over there too. Of course, guys, seriously, check out his show. I'm not just throwing in that plug because he's listening with us today and he's joining and engaging in this conversation. Ever since being a guest, I actually started listening to the podcast and there's some great conversations over there. So make sure to go check it out. But at the same time, go check out Vala. Voila, as he likes to put it. <laughs> um, wow. And hopefully that can help you in the future. Any investors out there listening to this show, go ahead and reach out to Christian. He'd be more than happy to connect. But Christian, before we close out today's episode, my final question I want to ask you is, if you had one piece of advice that you could sum up for the entire world to hear you, what would it be and why? Find out your true purpose in life and then never waver from that. Once you understand what drives you, why you want to be here, that's all you should do with your life. Anything else is a distraction. Perfect. Well, thank you. And thank you, everyone who listens to the Get Over Yourself podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure to leave us a five-star review and share this conversation with somebody who you feel like could benefit from it most. And guys, we'll see you next time.